it's time to get hands-on for this episode of Heartland Highways. We'll meet David Griffin, a Charleston-based artist and professor who creates one-of-a-kind pieces of jewelry and other types of art. Then, Larkfield Glass near Paris, Illinois takes the stage to show us how their beautiful glass art is made. Finally, we'll visit with Jerry Rhodes, a wood turner who specializes in creating bowls, mostly from recycled woods. That's just ahead on Heartland Highways. Every mile is an adventure here at Heartland Highways, and this week we're hitting the road to introduce you to three different artists. Our first artist is David Griffin, a mixed media and metal artist who also works here at Eastern Illinois University. Now, David uses a variety of techniques and technology to create his unique works. I instruct metalsmithing and jewelry design, and I myself am a jeweler, metalsmith. Uh, I, Metalsmith is a wide range topic because it covers so many different things from wearable jewelry to hollow wear, vessel wear, functional, you know, teapots and non-functional teapots, art one of a kind things, limited line production jewelry. So it's, it's a huge, huge um, topic or, or area, so to speak. So I, I, I go back and forth. I, I do vessels, I do art vessels, I do art teapots and I do um, uh, limited line jewelry, um, sterling silver, gemstones, things like that. And, and that has actually come a little bit more to the foreground lately because of some of the new technologies we've gotten at, at the studio and, and um, you know, with the, the new uh, facilities and, and things like that. No matter what David was doing, it was always some kind of art. His parents were stained glass artists, and he would help them with projects in the summers. After trying veterinary medicine and graphic design in college, he realized something was still missing. So I take my first uh, metals class as an elective, and then I, it's, it, it never looked back. I, you know, I realized I was spending all my time in the metals lab and just doing my, my graphic design projects as fast as I could so I could get back to the metals lab. And, and it was pretty much a no-brainer at that point. So I enjoyed being able to be the client. When you're in the crafts, you fall in love with the history, you fall in love with the techniques, um, um, and you fall in love with the media, and, and you find out what you can do with it, how it responds to you as you're working with it, um, and your response back to it. Uh, metal seems cold and sort of heartless, but it really isn't. I mean, and that's what I stress to my students is that um, it doesn't take a strong person to deal with metals. You don't have to be physically strong. It's, it's actually, you have to be very sensitive to it. You have to understand when it's telling you that it's overworked uh, and it needs to be annealed and, and realigned so that you can work it more. Um, and, you know, filing and sanding and sawing, it, it, it's, it's actually a real sensitive material to work with and, and, and learn. And David is always learning. He says his art goes through phases that correspond with his life. Currently, I'm sort of uh, dealing with the fact that um, on, on my vessel pieces, I'm using a lot of uh, wood included, um, turned wood pieces included with the metal, uh, which then has also been maybe uh, dipped in resin and uh, then turned back on the lathe again. So there's metal encased in a, a clear resin body with the wood being exposed as you turn it. Um, dealing with the, the woods that we live with out, you know, in south of town here in Charleston. Um, you know, it's, it's the environment I'm in now, looking at those things. I did a series of teapots based on cactuses, um, basically the idea of the cactus containing water and, and being treasured and, and, you know, out in the arid uh, desert southwest in the land that I grew up versus what my, my kids are growing up here, knowing cornfields and soybean fields and woods and everything else. It, you know, just that distinction between their childhood memories, my childhood memories, and it was all about family and stuff like that. So again, looking for that commonality um, in, in what the viewer brings to the piece, what I'm putting into the piece, and hoping to make that universal connection, which then makes it art, I guess. 
We spent an afternoon with David in the studio where he showed us how a custom designed piece of jewelry is made. You start with uh, a particular stone you might want to use, gemstone. These are some four millimeter round uh, blue sapphires. And I threw together some uh, quick uh, little earring uh, sets that we could, we could show and mill. Um, and we're going to mill these in just uh, jeweler's uh, wax. The wax block is then placed on the mill where a computer aided drafting program and 3D scanner are used to design the piece and cut it out. This cutting process can sometimes take up to six hours. The cutout wax pieces are then placed on sprues to prepare for the plaster mold creation process. This rubber base then allows us to put on the steel flask, which is going to house our earring model in there. And we're going to then pour in the investment, which is a high temperature firing uh, plaster, which is designed to go up to 1500 degrees so that at that point the wax is going to burn out and vaporize leaving us the core of the wax model and that's again why it's called lost wax casting. You're burning it out never to see it again because this mold is going to get destroyed at the end once the cast is made. After the wax is burned out of the cylinder the next step is to melt the chosen metal in this case sterling silver and start the cast. Next, we're going to uh, heat and preheat the, the flask or the crucible. So we're going to preheat this crucible up for a minute or so just to get it up to temperature. The heated cylinder with the mold is then placed in the centrifuge machine and the metal is melted, spun, and flung into the mold. We close the lid which then engages the motor and it is now currently spinning at a very high rate of speed, throwing the metal into, slinging the metal into the, uh, again, the, the hollowed out area where the wax burned out. Once it is cooled, the cylinder is dipped into cold water to remove the plaster. So we've, um, we've blown out the plaster and in my other hand is, is our casting and we can break off that flux. It's black because uh, the sterling silver oxidizes and so to get rid of that we, all we need to do is go take it in, anneal it with a, a, a slight soldering flame and we put it into a, a mild acid solution which then will clean it up and it'll look like the pieces that we looked at at the beginning of the demonstration where it's all white and ready for its final finishing. David's finished pieces are a one of a kind and are displayed nationally and internationally, maybe even in a gallery near you. This next story is about fulfilling a dream some 20 years in the making. I spent some time with Randy and Joy Turner at their home in Edgar County near Paris, Illinois. Well, that dream is now a reality as the Turners are operating their own glass blowing studio. After living in other parts of the United States, Randy and Joy Turner moved back to Joy's family farm near Paris, Illinois in 2003. They wanted to take glass blowing to the next level and started plans for their own shop and studio here on the farm. But their love for working with glass goes back several years. The Turners met in graduate school and while dating, Joy suggested they take an art class. She took pottery and he chose glass blowing. <laughs> I had done glass blowing as an undergraduate in chemistry where you do the flame work on the vacuum lines and such, and I had become attracted to glass and what it can do and, and the fire. And then I saw that they had this glass blowing class, and this is with a big furnace and the long pipes, and I must try this. <laughs> While working as a mechanical engineer, Randy continued to hone his glass blowing craft on the side with the idea that someday he could do it full time. I loved it so much and loved the glass so much that we wanted to do this not, not as a hobby, but as a business. And that's still the intent, you know, if I can transition from engineering five days a week to maybe four days a week, 
to maybe three and then finally say, no, this is going well enough that, that this is what I'm going to do all the time. That's the goal. We're not there yet, but that's the goal. <laughs> Using his engineering skills and her chemistry background, the Turners built their own studio on the site of an old corn crib. In 2007, Larkfield Glass became a reality. That's what my parents called this farm. When they moved out here in the years after World War II, there was a lot more grassland around farms than farmers all maintained a, uh, a lane that had grass along it and there were, there were a lot of metal larks at that time. <laughs> It's also, we wanted to use it because we figured that would be a website that wasn't already taken. She and I built this shop by ourselves. <laughs> we joked that if we couldn't make money uh, blowing glass, maybe we could write a book, you know, how to build a pole barn with just you and your wife. <laughs> but the way I did it is I went to various manufacturers of all the pole barns that you can find, you know, all over the place. Arthur, there's one in Charleston, or a couple in Charleston and looked at how they did things and said, yeah, that's a good idea, or no, that's, that's a problem, that's gonna break after a while, and kind of combined what I thought were the best of, of all their ideas and how they did it, and built this. So there were no plans for this. Randy is the primary glass blower, and Joy handles sales, marketing, and is assistant to Randy when he's working on complex pieces. He, he does some pieces by himself, a number of pieces go a little easier with a second pair of hands. Some it's essential. Um, and I just like to be out here. <laughs> Sometimes I'll bring something else I'm doing out here. Uh, but there, there's usual other tasks to be done. I, for instance, sign all the pieces that he's made. Uh, Don't look at my handwriting. <laughs> if you'd seen his handwriting. You know. So I'll, I'll be there engraving Larkfield glass in the year on the bottom of a lot of <laughs> it's very. It, it's a lot easier to get a piece centered on the pipe when I'm switching pipes. Uh, if I have help. Mm -hmm. I can do it by myself, but it's a little harder to get it centered. And if I'm trying to, glass is such that if you keep it centered, then you can do what you want with it. I can make it off-centered if I want. If it's off-centered, it's going to do what it's going to do, and I really pretty much have no control. So when I'm switching pipes, I still want it symmetrical and centered so that I can, you know, kind of tell it, go this way. Randy creates vases, bowls, paperweights, and even fish. The initial design and final result is only limited by his imagination and sometimes what the glass decides to do. A lot of your pieces um, show the liquidity of glass. They're, they're uh, not uh, rigidly exactly symmetrical, although some are, and he can work symmetrically if he wants to, um, but a number of the pieces will have a, a playful little twist on one side or a, a wave moving across them um, to, to give you a feeling that during the working, the glass is soft and it's liquid. <laughs> I've made several vases that are like 30 inches tall. Well, I've got one that went right over the edge and the, the 30 inch tall neck just kind of flopped all over the place. So I wrapped it around the vase. <laughs> and it won't hold anything, but it, it's kind of cool to look at. It takes patience. It really does. Uh, it doesn't look like it at times. It looks like I'm running around with this on fire, but, uh, there's a long period early on in shaping the piece in which it doesn't look like much is going on. He's, he's getting the bubble started, he's keeping it centered and, and beginning to elongate it, but, but the change is not very dramatic. And uh, if we're doing a demonstration, particularly with young people, I'm frequently kind of trying to fill in that period and yes. keep them from getting bored. <laughs> but it, it has to be built up patiently at that point in order to, as, as he mentioned earlier, have the symmetric base to then if you want to have a long floppy edge on it if you want and being able to be patient with that much heat right by you is just not possible with quite a number of people. A fair number of people that think glass blowing would just be the neatest thing find they cannot tolerate that much heat for very long if it's just radiating heat at them they're going, can we finish up this part get through this part quickly and well no, you need to uh, start out and build up the shape on it, um, build the color up at that point uh, with what color you want to show from the inside. 
uh, and what color you want to show from the outside and the, the pattern. One of the things that you get better at with practice is working what we call hotter. That uh, when I'm reheating the glass, uh, when I was first starting, I wouldn't reheat it very much because I suddenly can't control it anymore and I go out and it's really too stiff to do anything. You know, if I compare myself now with what I was then, I would lose every piece that I have because I'm working a lot hotter. And when you work hotter, you can do more things with a glass that you can't do when it's cold. For Randy and Joy, their plans are to continue creating Larkfield glass with the idea that Randy will soon be able to do it full time, making those plans from so many years ago a reality. I frequently say to classes of, of students that we have out here, if there's something that you're just on fire to do and it doesn't look Keep possible, start planning for it anyway. Plan as if you could do it. Begin to think what it would take to make it real. Even if it takes 25 years, Which that's did here. okay. <laughs> Now you can watch Heartland Highways online anytime. Check us out on youtube.com slash WEIUTV. Once you're there, just look for the Heartland Highways playlist, which will take you to a list of full episodes from seasons 7, 8, 9, and 10. Well, Kate, have you heard the saying, if a tree falls in the woods, does it make a sound? Oh, yeah, actually, I have heard that. Okay, for this next guy, a better saying might be, if a tree falls in the woods, do you make a bowl out of it? <laughs> Well, for Jerry Rhodes, he's spending his retirement years at his home in St. Joseph, Illinois as a wood turner, creating one-of-a-kind pieces that are both functional and beautiful. The woods I work with are mostly free wood. <laughs> I get most of my wood at the Landscape Recycle Center in Urbana. It's a Champaign County Landscape Recycle Center. I get a lot of wood when I hear a chainsaw running and I go down and see what's being cut down and take them back a bowl and an ink pen in six months or so and they'll call you again when, you want some, when they have some wood they're cutting down. So. It's hard to believe that an ordinary piece of wood can be shaped and sanded into a piece of art, but in the hands of a skilled wood turner like Jerry Rhodes, anything is possible. A carpenter by trade, Jerry is no stranger to working with wood and got into wood turning as a way to wind down after a long day. Kinda, I'm mostly self-taught, which basically means I get all my inspirations and designs from many, many sources. In 05, I discovered there were other wood turners and wood turning clubs, and I joined a Central Illinois Wood Turners. And I still belong to that, but also in 2008, I and a few other people formed Flatland Wood Turners in Champaign, so we didn't have drive so far. Starting out on small items like pens, Jerry eventually worked up to turning out bowls and vases. He says that really any type of wood can be used, and you never know what you may end up with at the end of the process. Sometimes you will reornate a piece to highlight something or to eliminate something. But uh, uh, sometimes you don't know what you've got here to go on. I made a platter once that uh, uh, it's been sold for a while, but uh, I made a platter once and working that close to it, I did not notice. But, but when my wife took pictures and then posted them, she happened to take the picture just right and it looked exactly like a fish with some waves in it. And uh, sometimes you get that. I've had pieces that turn, uh, bowls that turned out, it looked like a bull's head uh, in the inside. Of course, I put a little red, red dye on that and highlighted it and sold it to a Bulls fan someplace. <laughs> While each wood has its own beauty, things like insect damage and spalting create unique lines and color variations. Spalting is the first stages of rotting. And if you get to the tree before it gets soft and punky, you get these black lines running through. In the lighter colored woods, the sycamores and the maples, is really nice looking stuff and uh, you tried to time it just right. Uh, some of us bolt our own wood. Uh, we experiment with it. We stand it up in a pile of uh, leaves and so chainsaw debris and try to keep it wet and covered when it's hot in the summer and we can create our own spalting. But it doesn't look as nice as nature's when you find it. <laughs> The turning process for making a bowl involves several steps. 
Jerry starts by cutting bowl blanks from the log. It's the side of the tree, not the middle, that will eventually become the outside and bottom of the bowl. The blank is mounted on the lathe and the process of removing the outer bark begins. Once that's done, he starts removing the inside. Using different shaping tools and just enough pressure allows the wood turner to remove just enough of the surface. Because the wood is green and still full of moisture, Jerry won't finish the bowl at this point. But most bowls I turn to 10% of the, their diameter, which this is about 10 inches, I would turn it to one inch thick, and then I soak it in denatured alcohol to break down the trapped water cells. You have the free water that spins out, and then you have the trapped water cells. It breaks those down, and then I brown bag it and tuck it in around the edges and uh, dry it, and most woods will dry in four to six m months. During the second turning, the bowl is made round again and turned into its final thickness, which in this case is pretty thin. The piece is sanded smooth and finished off with food-safe Danish oil. The turning process leaves behind lots of wood shavings, which are recycled and used as fire-starting material or mulch for gardens. Those pieces that don't make the cut will end up as decorator firewood, as Jerry calls it, or given away to family and friends. In addition to bowls, Jerry can also turn pens, bottle stoppers, vases, platters, and jewelry. The large bowls take a long time, but uh, many things don't take very long, so they are winding me down. Uh, things that, projects that you can do in an hour, uh, or two hours or a good wind me down, they don't take forever. And uh, yeah, if a person can keep it down to that, it's a nice hobby without getting too expensive. It just, once you get a little bit of habit, have a little bit of interest in wood turning, it is very addictive. <laughs> and you constantly see other people turning things with different tools and uh, I've got to have that and then I'll be better. <laughs> Sometimes that's not true, so a person learning should visit a wood turner and find out which tools they do not need to purchase. Jerry also teaches wood turning at Parkland College and CU Woodshop in Champaign, Illinois. He sells his work at art shows around the state and at the Urbana Farmers Market. Oftentimes, he'll set up a lathe and demonstrate wood turning for the public. For anyone interested in getting into this type of hobby, Jerry recommends looking up a local wood turning club or the American Association of Wood Turning. There are over 300 chapters, uh, several of which are in other countries. There are approximately 14,000 members that belong to the American Association of Wood Turners. Every year they have a big symposium. They do it regional. They scattered about the U.S. and. Uh, uh, that's a place to go and learn from the high name people to learn new tricks and new embellishments to bowls and platters and different things. Some of our favorite adventures were ideas that came from viewers like you. If you think there's a place we should see or a person we need to meet, let us know about it. Just make sure it's in the Illinois, Indiana or Missouri area. Drop us an email at heartlandhighways at weiu.net Call us at 1-877-727-9348 or send us a letter to 600 Lincoln Avenue, Charleston, Illinois, 61920. Well, that's the end of the road for this week's edition of Heartland Highways. Thank you so much for coming along with us. And you know, if you ever have a story idea, we'd love to hear from you. You can email us at heartlandhighways at weiu.net. Thanks for watching. Every mile is an adventure. Okay, <laughs> Don't ask us to walk and talk. It's too hard. The TV's hard. <laughs>
thing. If a tree falls in the woods, does anybody, what is the old, does it make a sound? <laughs> okay. Everybody else in adventure. It's amazing. Amazing. <laughs> yeah, I heard that. <laughs> no, I haven't. Uh, no. Okay. What do you mean? <laughs> Every mile is awesome. It's super fantastic. Amazing. <laughs> Highways at weiu.net. We'll see you next time. Shoot us. <laughs> I got sorry. <laughs> I can let you talk again. No, no, no. I don't need to talk again. Lori wants to talk. Talkie, talkie, talkie. Hockey, talkie, talkie. talkie, talkie, talkie.